I'd like to start today's show with a Bruce Kiskadden poem. This is actually the last stanza of a longer Kiskadden poem that I've heard Randy Riemann recite, and I thought it would be the perfect intro for today's show. No, you haven't made a fortune, and your hair is white, and you're old. But you wouldn't trade your memories not for heaps of shining gold. For whenever you get lonely, you put on a big review of the people and the places and the horses that you knew. You can hear the songs and stories, and you can see the campfire blaze as you live again the glories of your grand old cowboy days. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working Cowboy West and beyond. My guest today is Randy Riemann. Randy is a cowboy, a horseman, a rawhide braider, and one of the finest reciters of classic cowboy poetry. There are few people in the cowboy world who are respected as much as Randy Riemann, and I'm proud to count him as one of my friends. I sat down with Randy in Alpine, Texas, during the Texas Cowboy Poetry Gathering, and we recorded this interview. I knew that Randy did not grow up on a ranch or as a cowboy, and I was curious how he found his way out west and how he started his career as a working cowboy. Here's Randy Riemann. The cowboy career that I've had really, really started in Montana. But long before I got to Montana, I had an interest in cowboy things, all things cowboy, actually. And I was, you know, I was born in 55. And so I grew up in an era when most folks had a television and most of what we saw on that was uh, a western of some kind or a kind of hollywood version of the west and so like most kids from the 50s that was the era of gene autry and tex ritter and roy rogers and those guys and so like most kids that was early introduction into the cowboy culture which had nothing to do with the cowboy culture really but my granddad had been a, really he was an itinerant farm worker. He was a German immigrant that came to America. He had a second grade education. And he progressed through the Midwest and the West as a harvester of crops. And from that, from working as a man for hire, he would start in the Midwest and harvest wheat and move out to the coast and harvest fruit and go back to the Midwest and harvest corn. And that's how he made his living. But he also spent time in the Dakotas and worked a little bit as a cowboy. And so he worked on ranches. And I see these pictures of him when I was a little boy. I see pictures of my granddad horseback. And when I knew him, he was a Midwest farmer in Iowa. But I had a pair of spurs and they weren't custom spurs they were these classic spurs from the 1920s that were cast and cheap and he had a set of wrist cuffs and they were just plain leather with harness studs in a design and it was a texas star actually which i didn't even know that at the time i didn't know what the history was of the texas star or even the association But I somehow ended up with these two items that were my grandfather's. That's all that was left of his cowboy days ended up with me. So my early influence wasn't so different from everybody else's, except it got in way deeper with me than anything else. And so from the time I can remember, I had a fascination for horses and had a fascination for all things cowboy. 
But I didn't have the opportunity to really express that till much later when I was, well, just about 20 um, is when I left the Midwest. When I left the Midwest for Montana, I really didn't know anyone. I didn't, I didn't have a destination or a plan. I had $200 in a 1966 Chevy Impala, and I'd never been to Montana, although I had been um, Wyoming and Colorado. But I came to Montana and settled in the Bozeman area. And um, my interest was to find somehow to get involved in the cowboy culture because of all the things I did, I went to high school, I went to college, I worked construction, I built swimming pools, I I was in and out of college a little bit in my early 20s, and um, nothing ever stuck as far as an interest like the cowboy culture stuck all my life. I just dreamt of being able to ride and have horses and work as a cowboy. And so I met this fellow in Bozeman, Montana. His name was Buck Buckingham, and it was just a chance meeting. And we talked, and he had spent a lot of time cowboying. He'd grown up in the Sierras of California. He was a pretty good hand. And he said, well, we could get some horses and start them, and I could help you learn, and blah, blah, blah. And so that was all for that. And my job, when I went to Montana, I had worked in a cabinet shop when I was in college, so I was pretty decent with tools and woodworking. And there was an, a, a little place called Flat Iron Mandolins in Bozeman, Montana. It had started out in Colorado and had moved to Bozeman, Montana. And they built these little, fairly inexpensive, flat-topped mandolins. And I was in this guy's shop one day looking for work. I didn't know he was looking for anybody to hire, and we visited, and he asked me what I was doing. I had just moved to the Bozeman area. I didn't know a soul. I was staying at a campground, sleeping in a tent, and he said, well, I need somebody to resaw parts, and he showed me a shop and showed me all through the place, and I had a good friend in the Midwest who built guitars, so I was real familiar with the construction process, and I had done plenty of woodworking at times. So I took a job basically as the resaw guy in this instrument shop. And I would do that at night because he paid us piecemeal work. So in the daytime, I would start colts and ride with a friend for nothing. And then at night, I'd go in and I'd work in this mandolin shop. Um, eventually, I made the necks and fretted the fingerboards and did the inlay work and stuff. Um, and everybody could do a little something in the shop. I mean, I could, you know, put a body together or whatever. It was all pretty automated in terms of, um, it's not like carving a violin by any stretch of the imagination. But so I had pretty good skill set with my hands and I had this great thing that I could do in the evenings and make a wage while I was learning to be around horses in the daytime. And so really that was my my sort of beginning and this fellow, Buck Buckingham, was a great teacher. And he was kind of old school compared to the guys I got with later. He wasn't quite as uh, contemporary in his approach. But he had safe horses and he had good horses. And they were a little... They might not have moved quite as freely as what I learned to do later. But they were real dependable. And... And all of his horses rode and packed, and he could hook them to a wagon. And he and I just got on famously. He was a very romantic guy who grew up kind of where Hollywood is today. When he was a boy, they would go out to where Hollywood is today. It was all horse pastures for Republic Pictures. And he and his friends would go out and steal rides on these cavy horses for the movies. And that's kind of how he got started, and then he eventually worked as a cowboy, and then I met him all these years later, and he helped me get started with the young horses. And I hadn't really ridden much. I had never really ridden a saddle. I had ridden bareback as a kid and in high school as well. So he got me started, and and then the two of us spent several years just starting colts and um, doing day work for local ranchers in the Bozeman area. And one of those ranchers was a man named Kurt Halverson, 
who ran a 500 cow outfit, and we would go help him for free until I finally got a big enough skill set that I could get hired. And so my first cowboy job to draw a wage was with Kurt Halverson up in the Horseshoe Hills above Bozeman, a night cabin, which was pretty typical. That's pretty much if you're an entry-level cowboy, you're going to be the night caver. And what year would that have been? Late 70s, early 1980. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And the really amazing part was my, I mean, I couldn't have scripted anything that would have fit me better in terms of how to get started because I really had no skill set. I mean, Ross Knox laughs about, he talks about himself being so green he could hide in the lawn, you know. And I was exactly the same way. I didn't know when I was in the way or out of the way or, you know, I hardly knew which end the hay went in, I mean, when it came to livestock. And so my first two influences were really good hands. Um, Buck was a really fine horseman. Kurt was a really good horseman, but a great teamster and a really good cowman. And the two of them were... Um, 25 years older than me or more. And they were sort of really spiritual dads to me, too. They were both real solid uh, Christian men who lived it. It wasn't just talk. It was shoe leather stuff. They were manly men who um, had a real serious spiritual commitment. And so... As far as influences were concerned, I just couldn't have found two better guys because they were way more interested in my character and the development of that than they were interested in what kind of bronc rider I'd be or what kind of roper I'd be. Those things, the bronc riding was never a big part of my life ever because the influences I had, all of those guys were mature enough horsemen that they didn't want to mess around with a bucking horse when you're going out to do a job. If you wanted to do that for fun, that was a whole nother thing. But their ambition was to get along with the horse so that you didn't have to be a bronc rider, so that you could get out and do a job and have fun doing it and come back in one piece and not have to not have to have help walking when you were 60 years old, you know. And so real fortunate for me that right from the beginning – my influences for horsemanship were what I would call um, at the top of the pyramid in terms of how to do it smart and how to keep longevity in yourself. If you're going to work with big, heavy animals, if you learn to do it right, you can have a lot longer career than if you do it wrong. So. Randy Riemann is noted and respected for his skills as a horseman and spends much of his time traveling the U.S. and abroad conducting horse clinics. In this next segment, Randy talks about the men who have influenced his horsemanship and how he came to work with them. All the while I worked in Montana, certain names would come up when it came to discussions about horsemanship or roping or or stockmanship. And there were these names that always came up in conversation in the cowboy world. That was about the time that Ray Hunt started doing horsemanship clinics. And when I was on the West Fork of the Madison, I went to see Ray Hunt. And, of course, like everyone, we were just amazed at what Ray could do. Ray wasn't the most people-friendly guy on the planet, but he was a brilliant horseman. And we'd heard a lot about this Ray Hunt, who was traveling and sharing his knowledge with folks. And when you heard Ray Hunt's name, you heard Tom Dorrance's name with it, because Tom was Ray's major mentor and influence. And then you heard Bill Dorrance's name, which was Tom's brother. And then you heard two or three other names, always two, and it was Brian Newbert, and Joe Walter, and Billy Askew. And those guys were legends for me before I ever met them because I'd heard so much about them and their skill set and the way they thought and the way they worked. 
And so after a number of years of cowboying in Montana, I had a great discussion with a good friend of mine, a school teacher named Jim Schultz and a real pal. And he said, look, if you want to be good, you got to go where the good people are. And if you feel like you need more information than you're getting where you're at, you need to go. You need to go where it is. And so we talked about that. And I really didn't want to leave Montana, but those guys were in California and Nevada. They split their time in those two places. And so I drove down and I met Brian Newbert. And Brian had worked for Ray Hunt and he'd worked with Tom and Bill Dorrance ever since he was a teenager. And we really hit it off. And I asked him if there was ever a job that I could come and work with him, would he call me and let me know? And he said yes. And so I spent several days with him and helped him um, with some cattle. And Brian was way more experienced and skilled than I was or anybody else I'd met. He's not a lot older than, there's only three years difference in our in our ages, but there's about three decades difference in our experience level. And um, and so Brian knew what I was, but he also saw my ambition and my interest, and that's what he was looking for. If he was going to give anybody a job, he didn't care about their experience level. He wanted somebody who um, had ambition and drive and interest. And so, sure enough, about a year later, I got a call, and he said, Hey, there's a job. You have to spend some of your time in Nevada, but you'll get to come down here and be with me at the end of that time period in Nevada. And I said, What's the job? And he said, It's background in stalker cattle. So we would buy weaned calves and then get big bunches of them and background them, which is really just inoculations and and um, getting them fed up so their belly's all rounded out and then turning them out on pasture and growing them up to a certain weight before they get shipped to a feed yard somewhere. And so the operation was based in California, but we rented all of the um, country we could in Lovelock, Nevada, and some of it was desert country and some of it was alfalfa pastures that had been harvested, and then we would graze those alfalfa checks their um, irrigated alfalfa fields until we used all that up and then those cattle would be shipped down to California. So when I took the job, I took it just specifically so that I could get to be around Brian Newbert. And it was fantastic. Everybody was a super hand. Brian Newbert, Dick Cofield, a guy named Philip Hammerness, and I was the weak link on the crew for sure. And so I could learn from everybody. And everybody was super generous and gracious and and uh, I was just like a kid in a candy store because everybody had stuff for me I could see what Philip was a great healer and big loop guy and Dick was a fabulous header and Brian was good at everything and we handled all these cattle with stock dogs too and I had I had not been around stock dogs much but so I got an education it was like getting a PhD from the best people in the business um, I was the only single guy on the ranch. Everybody else was married and they had somebody cooking for them and packing their lunches and our days were really, really long. And I, I laugh about, I just looked like a starved down Ethiopian. I mean, I was, I was, uh, pretty lean and I would come home, we'd sometimes start two or three in the morning. We would never get home before seven at night and I might cook a batch of hot air popcorn while I was taking a shower and fall asleep eating it, you know, and get started the next day. But I just loved it. The crew was great. The horses were good. The country was gorgeous. Central California. I was rolling golden hills of California. And it was a big place. And we were horseback every day. I mean, that was our job. We we doctored cattle till we didn't want to see a sick one anymore. It was not uncommon for us to, in the summertime... To go out from May till October with a four-man crew, we would go out and doctor 40 to 60 head a day, you know, and it was all out in the pasture and it was heading and healing. It was just great. And there was a such a fine crew of men, 
And we literally, I mean, a 12-hour day was a short day, six days a week. First 18 months I worked for him, I never had a day off. And there was never a cross word on that crew. Everybody had fun every day. Guys would fall asleep in the pickup. They were so tired, and their head would loll over on you, and you just shove it out of your way. And the dogs would be sleeping on the headache rack in the back of the flatbed, you know. Everybody just shot, just wore out. We'd go through two horses and two dogs every day, but never had a never had a crossword on the crew in four years. It was just one of the best experiences of my life. And it really was a big turning point for me to see horsemen who were super skilled, way beyond the norm. And Brian was one of those guys. Brian introduced me to Joe Walter, to Bill Askew, and to Tom and Bill Dorrance. And so all of a sudden, my influences, um, I was just getting exposed to things that I didn't know about, I'd never seen. Even the philosophical thought behind the actions was different from anything I'd ever been around. And I hadn't been around bad stuff. I wasn't around people who abused horses. I wasn't around guys who abused cattle. They respected them and treated them with real deference. But I had, this was just a whole other level of everything. The roping was the best I'd ever seen. And to to this day, there are better ropers now than there were then. And, you know, learning to, Learning the hip shot from Bill Dorrance back in 30 years ago was that was about as as good a thing as you could know, and it's come a long way. So that's kind of kindergarten stuff now, you know. This whole exchange of information of these great practitioners has opened up, and it's everywhere. You can go, you can go to New Zealand or Switzerland or France or Germany, and you're going to find somebody who can throw a figure eight and a, you know, I mean, it's just amazing the exchange that's taken place. Largely it started with Ray Hunt and moved to other people. Um, And now the level of horsemanship and stockmanship is as high as I've ever known it to be. I don't, I'm sure it, there was a certain skill set that those old timers had that came up the trail with Longhorn cattle, and and it's it's nothing to sneeze at. They had to have a really amazing skill set to do the things they did, but the, the finesse and the uh, smoothness that people can ride and rope and get a horse on a cow. Today, I think it's probably the highest it's ever been in history. I'm just sure of it. Um, there's more information being exchanged, and there's better horses being ridden. Um, some people might argue that those horses in the day, whenever that was, you know, were unmatched. I think every era has its appropriate pride level of the animals they were around, but. Um, I've seen a lot of footage from back in the 20s and the 30s of cow working, and and it's pretty crude compared to what you'll see today. And I think the gear is the same. The old timers used to talk about the saddles ate at both ends, and everything has just changed. You know, the guys that I got around, especially in Nevada and California, more in California than Nevada, too. They were real real smart about their gear. They rode better horses. They rode them all year long, unlike Montana, where you might spend two or three months in the winter and and rarely get horseback if you didn't have to. These guys have good weather, and they're going to roping competitions, and they're going to horse shows, and they're taking their work string and getting them ready for other things. And so there was just, it's just sort of goes with the territory. And I don't think, I don't think I ever um, would say that the best hands are here or the best hands are there, but the best hands I've gotten to see, they all have a common uh, background and it's central California directly from the Dorrance brothers. Um, more so than Ray Hunt. Um, 
Ray was real influential on the clinic circuit from about 1980 on. But um, the guys that spent more time with Bill and Tom Dorrance than they did any other influential horsemen, they're the best hands that I've seen myself. And I've seen some pretty skilled guys through the years who didn't get around Tom and Bill, but they got around the guys Tom and Bill tutored. That's probably not the right word, but influenced. And they didn't just influence their horsemanship, they influenced the way they viewed life and lived life, too. Tom and Bill were both real different, but... but um, very similar in that they were they had great humility and incredible skills the, but they were just devoid of ego they just were not um i never saw an ounce of ego in either one of those guys they they were humble and super capable never braggadocious or boastful or flamboyant in any way they could accomplish incredible things bill's rawhide braiding is a great example there are some braiders who are in the cowboy hall of fame who are really heralded and well and common names and they didn't make anything nicer than what bill Dorrance made you just can't imagine the quality of work that guy did and some of us have been lucky enough to see it because it's not on display in a museum somewhere. You just had to go to Bill's Rawhide Room to see it. And they just had a skill set that's just remarkable. And evidently all the brothers did. I never got to meet Fred or Jim. I only met Tom and Bill. And I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with Bill. And we did a film together, and I stayed at his house every for about a 10-year period, I was going back and forth to Hawaii to start Colts for the Parker Ranch. And whenever I wasn't in Hawaii, I was at Bill's Ranch in California. And it wasn't some kind of great, insightful thing on my part. I just loved being with Bill, and I had time and no other obligations. And so I was making a paycheck in Hawaii starting Colts, and I'd ride about 10 Colts a day for 10 months or so, or sometimes six or seven months up to 10 or 11 months, depending on the year. And then any other time I had free, I would go spend it with Bill Dorrance. And that's where I learned to braid. I had interest in a rawhide riata, and Bill was famous for his riatas. He made a lot of, he had made more reins and romals and bozals and things than he did riatas, but Bill loved to rope and he loved a riata, and he made the best riatas, I think, that I've ever seen. I can't, I never saw a fresh Riata Bill made because he had stopped building by the time I came along. But even his older, worn out Riatas felt better than anything else I've ever seen. And everybody that I talk to who is pretty um, aware of good gear. They comment about the difference in Bill's Riatus. There was just nobody felt one that felt like the ones Bill had made. And we've tried to analyze it and figure it out. It's kind of like a Stradivarius violin. You know, they're always taking samples to figure out what the finish was and, and measurements to see how they carved the top. Well, that's kind of what we've done with Bill's Riatus. We, we looked at the angle of the bevel and the depth of the string and the width of the string and and there was just something about what Bill put in those things that made him really special. And he kind of did that with everything. His reins, his romals, his, his, his gear was, was uh, as good as anybody ever made in, that I've ever seen anyway. folks that's it for this episode i'll pick up where i left off on the next episode with a second part of my interview with randy Riemann. i'd like to thank randy for taking the time to visit with me you can find out more about randy at randyreeman.com 
You can find out more about me and this show at andyhedges.com. If you're enjoying this show and would like to help support it, you can make a donation on the website. Or you could leave a review on the iTunes store. and Be sure and subscribe while you're there. It's free. Or you could go to my website and buy a CD or a t-shirt. And don't forget to sign up for my email list when you're there. If you have a story or a comment you'd like to share with me, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. Crossroads.